So have you met your fraudulent neighborhood consultant who gives you all the right reasons to easily immigrate to Canada, then proceeds to take in your money only to never again return or answer your phone calls? Well, I have and it's happened to me too. But don't tell my wife, she doesn't know about it. Make sure you stick around till the end because we're also going to reveal the documents you must have even before you log in your profile for the express entry. And I strongly recommend you do not log in your profile without these documents. So in this two-part video, we're going to cover if you're even eligible for the express entry system, the federal skilled worker program, and the comprehensive ranking system. In this part, I'm going to teach you how to determine if you are even eligible to apply for the express entry and how to calculate your federal skilled worker program score correctly. So here we go back to the basics, to the very beginning of time. I mean the express entry process of course. After watching both videos, I can guarantee you that your friendly neighborhood fraudulent consultant will never cheat you again. Why? Because you would now know what you didn't then. Launched on Jan 1st, 2015, the Express Entry is an online immigration application system. It allows you to submit a profile and be considered as a skilled immigrant to Canada. So if your ranking is high, you are invited to apply for a permanent residency. This system replaced the old system, which was a first come first serve spaces or a first in first out system. One of the challenges with the old system was it led to long queues and ultimately loss of skilled employees. In fact, there were times when candidates received an ITA after they had passed away. The Express Entry manages the Skill Economic Immigration Program. These include the Federal Skill Trade Program, the Federal Skill Worker Program, the Canadian Experience class, and some other PNP programs. The whole concept of the Express Entry is to get skilled workers from outside Canada, take their skills, education, and other human capital factors and apply it to the Canadian economy. So, what are the reasons you could be found inadmissible under the Express Entry program? There are several reasons that we're going to go through. The first reason are for security reasons, for example, if you were involved in espionage or maybe if you were involved in an attempt to overthrow a government or maybe you were involved in violence or in terrorism. In that case, you would not be admissible to immigrate to Canada. The second reason is human or international rights violation. So in case in the past, if you were committed to war crimes or you've done any crimes against humanity or if you were also involved uh, as a senior official in maybe in a government which was engaged in gross human rights violation. In that case also, your application would most likely be denied. The third reason is if you have a past criminal record. So the past criminal record would also involve your charges for a DUI. So in the past, if you were probably caught and convicted under driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol, in that case also with past criminal record, you would most likely not be eligible to immigrate to Canada. The fourth reason is organized crime. So in the past, if you were a part of an organization that was involved in a criminal activity like money laundering or smuggling, or for that case, even human trafficking, in that case, you would not be eligible to immigrate. And the fifth and the final reason are for medical conditions. So in case if your medical condition would endanger the public health of the people living in Canada or the public safety of the people of Canada, or if it calls an excess demand on the health or social service of Canada. In that case also, you would not be eligible to immigrate. Now let's discuss the Federal Skill Worker Program or the FSWP as it's more commonly called Stage 2. So Stage 2 is the Federal Skill Worker Program. So by now I would assume that you don't have a criminal record, you have no past medical condition and you have now moved on to stage two, which is the Federal Skilled Worker Program. The Federal Skilled Worker Program is basically determined by a selection of six factors. The Federal Skilled Worker Program. So the overall score for the Federal Skilled Worker Program is 100. Now, if you score 67 points, you qualify for the Federal Skilled Worker Program and you move on to the next section, which is the Comprehensive Ranking Score. If you score less than 67 points, in that case, you do not qualify 
for this program and you do not qualify to immigrate to Canada under this particular program. So the six factors that would determine if you move on to the next stage, that stage three, the comprehensive ranking score are your language skills, your work experience, your age, your education, arranged work employment, that is if you have a job offer from any company in Canada, and the adaptability points. So let's look at each section in detail out here. So in this part, you at least need to score a CLB level 7. So what are the CLB level 7? So if you score 6 on each parameter, for the speaking, you get 4 points, for listening, you get 4 points, reading 4 points, and writing 4 points. However, keeping in mind the current CRS score and what it is at the moment, I would recommend you score at least a CLB level 9 in your Federal Skill Worker program. So what is a CLB level 9? Well, on speaking, you have to score an 8. And on listening, reading, and writing, you have to score a 7. So it's basically an 8777. In case you may know French, and French is your second language, and you score at least a CLB 5, that's a 4 on each ability, in that case, you would also score an additional 4 points. Now, it's very important you identify what is your NOC code for each job that you want to include in your Express Entry Profile. So before you are starting your immigration process, one of the things you must do is identify what is your NOC or what is your national occupation classification. So try to find an NOC code that best matches each of your past jobs. The NOC is a list of all occupation and gives a brief description of the duties, skill, talents for various jobs. Before you begin the process, you would need to identify what is your NOC code for each of your past jobs. If your job description and the list of main duties match, in that case, you can count this experience for your point. For more information on how to find your NOC code, you can click on the link that I mentioned below. So to score points under the work experience section, there are certain criteria that you have to meet. Number one, your experience must at least be for 12 continuous months full time. So this would be at least 30 hours per week or 1,560 hours per year. The experience must be skilled work experience. So it should either fall in skill level zero, A or B. And this experience must have been completed in the last 10 years. As you can see from the chart below, the maximum points you can score in the work experience section is 15 points. So let's say if you have completed a work experience between four to five years, you would score 13 points. For two to three years, you would score 11 points. And if you have one year of work experience, in that case, you score nine points. The next section is the age. Here, you can score a maximum of 12 points. So you would score 12 points if you're between 18 to 35 years old. After 35 years old, for every year you get older, you start losing a point. Like if you're 36 years old, you score 11 points. If you're 37 years old, you score 10 points and so on. The maximum points you can score on the education sector is 25 points. So if you've done your PhD, you score 25 points. For your master's, it's 23 points. Let's say if you have completed your bachelor's and you have an additional qualification, like a post-graduation certificate or a double bachelor's, in that case, you would score 22 points. A tip here would be to calculate the points for the education section only after you get your ECA report. So that would determine what is the correct education score you would have. So for arranged employment, the maximum points you can score is 10 points. So in case if you have received a job offer from a Canadian employer uh, that is at least valid for one year, in that case, you're eligible for the 10 points. Now, you have to make sure that the job offer you receive is before you apply to come to Canada under the Federal Skill Worker Program. And the job has to be a continuous job, it has to be paid, it has to be full-time work, which is a minimum of 30 hours a week. It has to be non-seasonal and should be valid for at least one year. More importantly, it should be either in skill type 0, A or B. Adaptability section. So the year you can score a maximum of 10 points. So in case your spouse has taken the IELTS exam and has scored a CLB level 4 or higher, then you score 5 points. If you've studied in Canada in the past and you've completed at least 2 academic years of full-time study in a secondary or a post-secondary school in Canada, 
you score 5 points. If your spouse has also studied in Canada in the past and has completed at least 2 academic years of full-time study at either secondary or post-secondary, you score 5 points. So if you worked in Canada in the past and it was at least one year full-time work in Canada, which was either in the skill level 0, A or B, and you were authorized to work in Canada as you had a valid work permit, in that case, you score 10 points. If your spouse or partner did at least one year full-time work in Canada on a valid work permit or was authorized to work in Canada, in that case, again, you score 5 points. If you or your spouse have a relative who's living in Canada and is 18 years or older, and is a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, which is either a parent, a grandparent, a child, a grandchild, a sibling, an auntie or an uncle, or either a niece or a nephew. In that case, you score a full 5 points. If you have a range employment in Canada, again, you score 5 points. So here's a complete list of the most important documents you must have handy even before you submit your profile. Before you apply, you must have a valid passport. That is you, your spouse, and your children. If you're traveling as a family, you need to ensure your passport has a validity of at least two years. The entire process from the start to receiving your ITA could take somewhere between 12 to 16 months, depending on your case, of course. So you wouldn't want your passport to expire after you receive your ITA, would you? A valid ECA document. Now your ECA document is valid for five years. So make sure this document is current when you actually log in your profile. For more details on the ECA process, you may click on the link that's above. Your IELTS report. Now this is applicable for the principal applicant and could also be applicable for your spouse depending on he or she is traveling along with you. Remember your IELTS report is only valid for two years and you must go a CLB 9 at least to even dream of getting an ITA. Proof of work experience. Remember the format for your proof of work experience has to be in a way the immigration officer expects it to be, not the way you want to submit it. I have also put a link to my video on how to prove your work experience in the link above. The birth certificate. Now this is one of the most underestimated documents. Did you know getting a proper birth certificate could take somewhere between 3 months to 12 months? It took me 2 years to get my birth certificate rectified. Remember your birth certificate has to be in a computerized format, not in a handwritten format. More importantly, the names on the birth certificate, that's the name of the principal applicant or the dependents that's traveling along with the applicant, has to be the same as in the passport. Ensure there are no spelling mistakes. In case if the birth certificate is maybe in a regional language, in that case, it has to be transferred into English. So do not underestimate this document. Make sure you have this document ready even before you log in your profile. Your civil marriage certificate. Make sure you have a civil marriage certificate. I cannot stress to say the number of candidates I've actually come across who are married for almost a year and still don't have a civil marriage certificate. Remember, without a civil marriage certificate, you cannot prove relationship to your spouse. So this document is also a compulsory document in case if you are traveling with your spouse to Canada. Your divorce certificate. You also need to make sure you have a divorce certificate in place in case you are divorced. So in case your brother and sister lives in Canada and you're claiming points, in that case, you would also need to submit a copy of their passport or their PR card while submitting a document. In addition, you may also require a copy of their birth certificate. And in case of any mistakes, a letter of explanation may also be required. Now, just a word of caution, never accept what someone has done in the past as the actual law. Remember, immigration changes, laws changes, and policies change. Thanks for joining me. My name is Jason, and if you could drop a like to let YouTube know that my video was decent, that would really help me a lot. And I would also appreciate a little click on the subscribe button below. And do drop a new experience with your friendly neighborhood fraudulent consultant in the comment section below if you're into that sort of thing. In case you'd also like to book me for a consult with reference to applying for the Express Entry program, you may do so by clicking on the link in the description box that's below. I'll see you in part two of this video.